uh, we all responded incredibly quickly, um, obviously, when the, well, at least in California, the shutdown orders came in and we really sent people home overnight. And, you know, we sent them home with um, whatever we had, whatever laptops we had on hand. Um, you know, people were using their own home computers. They were, they did, we didn't have work phones to send them home with. So they were using their cell phones. They, you know, kind of scrapped around and made do with whatever applications they could, that they could find to make them get their work done, whether it was Google Voice voice or finding some scanning application or figuring out how to do, you know, downloading a trial for some e-scanning application. And they were incredibly creative and really adapted to the environment because they really wanted to get the work done and they really wanted to serve clients. And, you know, I really want to take a moment to appreciate that incredibly, that incredible adapt adaptation and, and creativity on the part of our staff to keep getting work done through all of that. Um, and then gradually, of course, over the past now more than year and a half, um, we did adapt, right? We got, we finally got computers and we finally, you know, we were now finally to the point where everyone has a legal aid issued laptop and we got a voice over IP phone system and everybody can now communicate with clients by voice and text through the phone system. We're using Microsoft Teams for internal collaboration. Um, so we, we kind of caught up with everything and, and implemented and deployed lots of solutions. Um, knowing all of that, I still have in the back of my mind the sense of I don't know exactly what everybody's doing. Um, I think there are probably some people out there who, even though they have a lovely little Dell laptop that I gave them, are still using their old clunky workhorse personal computer sitting on their desk at home that they're used to and like. Um, I know that there are people that are still using Google Voice for client meetings and client conversations and meetings. Um, and I don't know how much of how many other things that are like that are out there. And, and, and so I feel like, um, or, you know, what we've talked about is this is a time when we need to really do that taking stock where we really need to kind of enter a discovery phase of what's out there. What are people using? Um, and the reasons are twofold. You know, one reason is, is addressing risk, right? It's what, what's out there that could come back and, and, you know, bite us down the road, like, like somebody using an insecure personal computer that, you know, then somehow that gets hacked. Um, so that's obviously one set is just that sort of risks of not knowing exactly what, not knowing exactly where your data is sitting and how it's being used and how it's being disseminated and, and needing to get a handle on that. And then the other piece of it, the other side of that is really opportunity. Um, our staff, you know, did an incredible job of doing this adaptation and we've learned some things, you know, we were not a shop that said we could support remote work for attorneys and then suddenly we can. Um, we made access to clients easier in some ways that would like that would um, they, I'm sure they would like to retain and we would like to maintain um, after these, this emergency situation is over. We, you know, we, didn't, we didn't allow them to text us documents, right? Now they can um, take a picture with their phone and upload a document to us. And that wasn't something that we really were set up for before. Um, we, most of our work was face-to-face um, you know, -face client meetings. And now we've really figured out ways to do a lot of things by phone. And for a lot of clients, especially clients who are older and with disabilities, that's easier for them um, and, and you know, uh, limits, eliminate some of those travel barriers. Um, so we've increased some technology barriers, reduced some travel barriers, and we need to kind of take stock of all of that and figure out what the right balance is in terms of um, maintaining some of that flexibility and increased access to clients and different ways of providing service um, in more accessible ways. Um, and at the same time, get a hold of some of those risks, um, you know, get, figure out what those risks are and get those under control. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. And, you know, some of the ways that I'm thinking of doing that, that um, would be even as simple as just doing a user survey to figure out, you know, what, what exactly are people do it using for different kinds of um, solutions um, and then trying to do that in a really non-judgmental way where we're really, you know, appreciating that creativity and then, you know, thinking that later, once we really do do that taking stock, we can come back and say, okay, there, there are real security reasons why some of those things aren't okay. Um, but, you know, uh, while well, taking the time and trouble to understand the problem that people were trying to address and making sure that as we're proposing solutions, they're really tailored to what they were trying to do and how they were trying to get their work done. Um, and making sure that we provide adequate training to, to, for, for new solutions that we're proposing. Um, so, you know, the, 
you know, user survey, really figuring out what people are doing um, are one of the things that we want to make sure that we're that we're doing now. Um, and then also just generally updating our inventory, you know, what, what systems are we using? What cloud services have we now brought in? Um, and I, I realize that more now when I'm doing onboarding of new staff is like, where, you know, what are the six logins that I've created for them when it used to be one? Um, and so what are all those services? How are they integrated? What are we doing around um, managing, you know, that set of, of passwords and identities? And then, of course, you know, updating our, our disaster recovery plan and documentation. So just making sure that all those pieces are in order um, now that we're, you know, kind of in this taking stock phase. And at this point, I will turn it over to, um, I think John's going to introduce this part, right, on the technology tools and policies. Sure. So um, and thank you, Stacey. So I, I think what when the, the three of us met, we uh, actually I say the four of us met with Ladudra. Um, uh, we were we we know that there's obviously a very limited amount of time to to talk today, and so we wanted to focus on were some practical things that we think executive directors and 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 likely already IT um, uh, managers and leaders are, are already um, thinking about, but that we wanted to focus the conversation on some of the priorities that that um, that every organization should be. Um, sort of focusing on, um, and then uh, you know immediately, or or maybe have already taken care of some of these items, and then some longer uh, term um, security um, uh, uh, initiatives or tasks for for organizations to investigate and uh, and hopefully um, uh, uh, move forward on as well. So um, so there's sort of two parts to this. And uh, Elena, do you want to you know, take us sure. off? Sure. So I'm going to talk about some, I'm going to call them baseline or low-hanging fruit. Um, and, and a lot of these are a spectrum. Like you can start with some low-hanging fruit and, and then John will talk about some deeper dives that you can do in this. But I think first and foremost, making sure that you have cyber liability, cybersecurity insurance. Just the questionnaire that you have to fill out to get that will give you a good checklist of things that you should be doing. And if you're not doing, they'll often require that you do it in order to have coverage. Um, so if you don't have it, make sure you get it. And if you do have it, review your policy to see what it covers and what you should be doing in order to make sure you maintain your coverage. Um, Stacy touched upon this, but having a, knowing your technology, knowing what's out there, what hardware, what software, what's already in the cloud um, that you're providing. And then to Stacy's point, what are people using on their own? What are, and, and oftentimes if you find that they're using something off on their own, why are they using it? And do you as a program need to provide a, an enterprise level solution so that others in your program can benefit from it. Um, but just knowing what you have is important because you can't protect yourself if you don't even know where your risks could be. Um, a BYOD policy, again, as Stacy mentioned, we all sort of pivoted very quickly to virtual. And in some cases that meant people taking their own devices home with them and just working on those. Um, and maybe now we've bought some laptops, we've got people on more equipment, but really knowing that if people are using their phones, you need a policy and sort of policy is the first step. Eventually you need to get to a mobile device management, but at least have a policy on what they can use the device for or password protection that they have to have on the device. Um, if they are not allowed to access something, even though if you, if you can't use a mobile device management uh, program right off the outset, but at least make them sign something saying, we won't go into these programs. I, I you know, attest that I won't use them on my personal cell phone, for instance. There's just a lot of risk with their own devices. You don't know if somebody else is using them. So at least having a policy so your staff is aware um, of what they should do. And the policy may look different for exempt versus non-exempt staff. So for instance, we don't allow Outlook access on cell phones for staff that's um, you know, uh, non-exempt because we don't want them working after hours on their phone. And so it may look different for different people. It may look very different for interns as well. There's maybe a less level of trust an employee versus an intern who might be gone from your program in two or three months. Um, make sure everything is up to date and know the frequency with which you update everything. So don't just like once a year we update everything. Uh, no, you should be doing it on a regular basis, on a scheduled basis. And executive directors should be working with their IT departments to make sure what the policy is and how frequently that's happening. People are our biggest liability. And one of the biggest ways that we're liabilities is password, passphrases, you know, everybody knows the, the sticky note under the keyboard situation. 
for a long time, um, we used to have loaner laptops and every time I would get it back, somebody would inevitably have put a sticky note with the password on it. And every time we'd rip it off and then it, it would magically reappear, obviously because people forget passwords, but you need to come up with a system that works and people need to have a good, and passphrases are better than passwords. And ideally you move to an enterprise level password manager, which not only keeps your passwords so that you don't have to remember all of these, but when passwords expire, which you all should have policies setting them to expire on a regular basis, it can generate, it can auto generate a, a password for you that isn't just your kid's name with their date of birth every time. Um, and you might switch that up, you know, depending on if you have to update the password. Um, Multi-factor multi -factor authentication. I think at this point, we're all familiar with this. You log into your bank, they send you a text to make sure it's you. You log into Google for the first time, Gmail for the first time, and they send you a text. It's the same concept. Initially, you're going to want to do this on the programs that you use the most, and that's why it's sort of low-hanging fruit. It could be a much bigger project where it eventually you put it in place for all the programs that you use. But if you're a Microsoft Outlooks uh, program or if you're Microsoft Suite or Google Suite, you're going to want to make sure at least those programs have MFA because that is where the bulk of your data and particularly client data is being stored. Um, so make sure that you have that in place and think about and plan long-term how to expand it to all the programs you use. Data and drive encryption. If you have, you know, work computers, all the drives should be encrypted. That protects your data. But again, because users are our biggest weakness, training your staff on encrypting sensitive emails, on not sending passwords via email. Um, so we have a medical legal partnership and the hospitals require us to send them encrypted emails. So, you know, we can do this. A lot of the programs already have it, uh, you know, in, out of the box. So Gmail or uh, Outlook has already some encryption services. If you don't want to fully encrypt an email, but you're sending passwords, PrivNote is an easy thing to use. Um, I always tell staff, if you remember Inspector Gadget, which at this point, I think I'm dating myself, but um, the note would self-destruct after he read it. Um, and so the same thing happens with the password. It's the, whatever you send through PrivNote eventually self-destructs, so nobody else can access it. Now, if your email is hacked, somebody has a PrivNote link in there, but they can't access it. They can't use it because it's already self-destructed. Um, make sure that your backups are comprehensive and that they are tested. And this, again, is a low-hanging fruit, but that can be sort of a little bit more long-term because you're going to want to make sure you test your backups, but eventually you're going to want to test how quickly you can recover if you have to go back to your, to your backups. Um, that may not be where you start off. Uh, first, you're just going to want to make sure that you're backing up. I can tell you, for us, we were backing up for a long time, and then we had two offices. We would back up on tapes and switch where the tapes were so that if one office experienced some kind of damage, the tapes backing up the other office would, you know, would be at the, at the other office. However, we closed that second location and it took months for someone to realize where are we backing this data up and what's happening now? And so in the same server room, we had the backup tapes and our servers. And that's a big problem because now if there's damage to that room, you've lost everything, including your backups. So we had to put a system in place. So make sure you know where your backups are and how frequently you're, you're backing up your data. Lock down your devices. Pins and passwords, obviously, for any work devices, but also making sure the device is auto-locked. So if somebody walks away, the device doesn't just stay open an unlimited amount of time. And lock down USBs. And this is probably one of the things that my staff hates me for the most. Um, it's better now that we're in the cloud, but for a long time, people would put something on a USB and then take it home and vice versa. Well, that's just a recipe for disaster to have that plugged into your computer. We even have a, we have a managed IT company. They do like penetration testing and that kind of stuff. And one type of testing they do is social engineering testing. And they literally drop a USB in your parking lot. And inevitably some really well-meaning employee will pick it up, go back to their desk and put it into just, who does this belong to so I can return it? And you have no idea what's on that, on that flash drive. So lock down the USB ports. Um, know which services you have via VPN, which services you have in the cloud, and maybe come up with a plan for for instance, our finance department uses quite a bit of software that they have to get into through VPN. They're not happy with it. It's slow. And the programs all have a cloud version. We just never had it because they were in the office and we didn't need it. So if it's possible, considering and planning maybe for the following year, budgeting for moving those services to the cloud, if it's a pain point for your, for your staff. But know what you have via access via VPN and know what is in the cloud, because that's how you also know your risk. And then... Tech support, and I think this goes back to what Stacy said at the uh, top of the presentation, which is 
your technology should not be independent of what your staff needs. It has to support what they need. And your security should, um, to the extent possible, not offer huge barriers. Because we know if we put up a lot of barriers, people are going to find workarounds and they're just not going to want to engage with your technology. So find out what your staff needs and find out the best way to meet those needs while still maintaining a security for your program. And a lot of this requires, even though we call this low-hanging fruit, this is going to require uh, training staff, bringing on staff and discussions with staff to make sure that they understand why you're doing all these incredibly painful things for them, like having their passwords expire and blocking USB ports and doing all of those things. Um, and then ultimately, how does this look if we come back to the office? Uh, if we're back full time, does any of this change? Do we have to have a plan for changes? I don't think any of us are going to revert back from the cloud, for instance, but if there's programs that you have now, for instance, we're using DocuSign for clients, do we stop using DocuSign once we're back in the office and people are now expected to come in to sign documents? I suspect not, but it's a conversation to have with our attorneys. Maybe we don't need the same number of envelopes or licenses. So those types of discussions. So you know what services you're going to continue past the pandemic. And John, I think you're going to talk now about some long-term yeah, deeper yeah. dive. And, and, and it's, it is, it's, I think that's a great way to put it. It's a deeper dive. It, there's some of the recurring themes here. It's taking it to sort of that next level. Um, and, and again, we're, we're sort of sizing this for our conversation today. It's not exhaustive. So I'm sure, um, and, and I encourage folks on the, uh, on the call to join in with their suggestions and comments in the chat um, with other ideas. But, but so for um, sort of a next level, one of the things that we think is really important, and again, it, it, it's something that involves both the leadership and the IT uh, team, is managing access, um, managing the movement and storage of data sort of more globally, diving in a little bit deeper, who has access, um, where can they access it? Um, how, how do we know whether they're um, uh, given sort of the right level of access? So for instance, um, I think a number of programs for, with their case management systems will give interns access to it. Are you locking down that access so they can't run reports and potentially, you know, you lose a lot of data when they leave a report on their school laptop, let's say. Um, so, so getting more granular, getting more specific with, with uh, data access is I, I think really important. And it will inevitably lead to other questions and conversations. Um, and again, this is why we think it's gotta be the, the, the leadership of technology and the leadership of the program working together. We can't work in a vacuum and we gotta involve our advocates um, uh, uh, to the extent we can to ensure that we're uh, enabling them and not, not, not uh, really um, sacrificing program delivery for security. We, we think they can, we can work together. Um, MDM, um, uh, again, that, that next level really is to push that out um, across all your services, um, especially your case management systems. Um, there are some programs that are using multiple MDM solutions. Um, the challenge for that is, of course, your users having to navigate through um, different um, uh, second factor um, systems, um, uh, still maintaining additional passwords and having to remember those passwords. So with a, um, an enterprise-wide MDM solution, get your case management system, your accounting system, your HR, your email, um, your documents, your even your VPN integrated into one solution. And, and that ultimately is a safer, simpler, easier to manage um, approach. Uh, beyond basic antivirus security, we really think uh, um, providers, and this is actually something that insurance providers, as, as Elena said, are starting to really kind of push the, the technology um, requirements, um, but moving to endpoint detection and response software that's really looking for um, uh, behavior, um, things that are happening on your laptop or on your servers that are out of the norm and, and interrupting that, stopping that, that activity, and in some cases allowing you to roll back to before that activity happened, but but also doing a good job of, of uh, raising the alert and alarm so that you can take action or your, your um, IT partner can. Um, uh, and that of course, you know, comes at a cost, but one, one of the things that's, that's uh, pretty either free or, or, or moderately expensive is, uh, is, is building out um, your logging of your existing environment. Um, so servers, laptops, pretty much every device has the firewalls have the ability to log um, events. And the more data you have there and the longer you retain it, the better, because if you have a security incident, you need to have um, as good an idea of what happened and when it started as possible. That really helps 
um, uh, inevitably the, the team that comes in to dissect what, what happened and, and, and take actions to help you restore your environment, do their job. So logging is really critical. Um, at some level, it's again, baked into like Windows, but, but you may set up either a server that, that captures that log and stores it or use a cloud-based solution. Um, and again, we, we talked a little bit, this is a progressive thing you know, about security audits, penetration testing. We really think that's something uh, important. Um, Legal Services Corporation this year has, has specifically called out um, the, the value of that with their, uh, their TIG applications, um, suggesting in, in with, the, with the TIP grants that, uh, that folks do uh, more security uh, investigation audits. Um, Another next step, and this is you know something where um, artificial intelligence is is sort of uh, um, uh, improving um, the availability of the service, and and I think eventually it will improve the cost of it. But using um, security information and event management, it it uh, it's something that a lot of the larger corporations and 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 larger law firms have been doing, and it's really um, taking that logging to the next level of of having. Um, uh, uh, enterprise-wide, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, analysis of your of your normal work, and then looking for things that are out of the ordinary. Um, so that's also something that uh, that we think it's worth investigating, um, and then scrutinizing your service providers. So it could be your cloud providers, um, like Microsoft or uh, a legal server or justice server, or your IT vendors who are doing your help desk. And making sure that they're walking, you know, shoulder to shoulder with you. So it's, you know, you don't want your weak link being your your third party provider, and and so that takes time, it's effort, um, and uh, and hopefully you have uh, partners that are 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 publishing that on their website or are happy to answer your questions. Um, and then again, I think this is why it's this is sort of iterative, looking at the systems that are working um, poorly, um, uh, you know, and, and causing pain for your users because. Um, Beyond it working, you know, you know, to the extent, for instance, you can get VPN in and access your files, that's great. But if it's causing frustration, it's gonna to lead to people doing things like saving documents locally um, or, or, or circumventing your, 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 your systems and some of your security. So it really is important to, to continue to meet with your, um, uh, your, your, your colleagues and ensure that they um, uh, know that you're concerned about their experience and, and that you're going to do everything you can and obviously with budget limitations as they are to um, to make this a better uh, environment for them. Well, I think we probably just overwhelmed everyone with all these ideas, but I think, um, Stacy, I think from our perspectives, how do we get there? How do we implement these things is the, is the next big question, right? Because these are all, I can... And we will be sharing checklists for like IT and, and executive directors, things to think about. Um, but people are your greatest weakness. And, and I mean, I can tell you our number one uh, tool in this toolbox is over communicating. We tell people what we're doing, why we're doing it. We do cybersecurity trainings. Um, and those are important for us to make sure that we bring people along. Um, and that way people understand the risks and why we're doing these things to protect ourselves, protect our data. And in some cases, especially with phishing scams, protect them as well. You're muted, Stacey. I know. <laughs> One of the components of that over communicating is, of course, to make sure that you have documented policies and practices. And that's really step one, because, if you, you know, if your staff can legitimately say, I didn't know I was supposed to do it that way. I didn't know I was supposed to use that. No one ever told me. I didn't know where to look all of which are completely common responses and often completely legitimate, especially when you're in implementing new technologies and systems quickly. Um, often you think I'll catch up with that later. I'll write that down you know, later. That I'll add that to the policy manual later. And often later never really kind of catches up to you. Um, so I think that's an important thing to make sure that you build in time for is make sure that you are you know, once you've done that kind of discovery piece of figuring out what is, what are all the systems, where is our data? What are all the systems and, and devices um, that we're using now? Um, and, you know, get that list up to date. Then what you're going to do is, is make sure that you have those policies documented on what you expect everybody to use for what use case and how you expect them to do it and what to do if they have problems with it and how to get training on it. Yeah. And I think, in the environment that we're in, we're, we're seeing some new challenges, right? Because for us, when everybody was in the office, our IT uh, department, our managed IT provider had a lot more control 
over all those security features. And now with everybody being home, um, or at least a good portion of our staff being home most of the time, there's all sorts of additional, you know, concerns and things that people need to know about. So it's we've had to update policies because we contemplate that even post-pandemic, remote work will be a significant piece of work going forward. Um, so updating those same policies to, to, to bake in what it looks like when you're home versus what it looks like uh, when you're in the office. Um, have you seen any other challenges with implementing some of these things, Stacey? Well, that's, you know, one of them that we just, you know, made me think of immediately was um, what to do about people's home internet. You know, if somebody has home internet that doesn't support, say, the, the Zoom meetings or the team meetings that we're requiring them to participate in, whether they're in internal or external, what do we do? Do we just say, well, you have to deal with it? Do we ask our, you know, managed IT provider to troubleshoot, you know, one by one our staff's um, home wireless routers and internet service? So, that, I mean, that's been a real challenge. and and you know, honestly, I don't. We have we don't have a good solution to that. We've basically just thrown hotspots at it. When somebody said, "I can't maintain a phone call or or a, or a Teams meeting," um, which works in some cases and doesn't in others, but I think for the longer term, where you have people saying, "I would like to work remotely two or three days a week," and they don't have that set up, what are you going to do with that? That's a big question. And we've been struggling with that with coming up with our long term telecommute policy, which is like, what are the baseline? technology, you know, needs. Um, and for a large part, you don't need, we don't need printers, we don't, but we do need a stable internet connection and a pretty, and especially at the beginning of the pandemic with everybody home, people who thought they had adequate internet before, that wasn't enough because they might've had four family members all in the household using up the, the bandwidth. Um, and to your point, Stacey, about, about tech support, it is, you know, our, our managed IT provider has been excellent throughout the pandemic, but uh, they've never, we have had people who they've had to call and say like, this is what you need to do, restart your router, do this, that, or the other, and they've done it, but it's very different to provide support when you have 60 staff members plus maybe 10 to 15 interns all in the office, all on the same network, all on the same servers versus everybody in their own home. And that's something to think about, especially if people are considering moving to a managed IT company. Um, that could mean additional costs if you're having significant uh, numbers of your staff working from home. Um, you know, one thing, Stacey, is sort of how do we budget for this? How do we plan for this financially? And, and that's a big question. And, and one of the things that we're starting to do is um, build it into grants, you know, make sure that we have, um, you know, a specific technology line item that we're building in that isn't just support for that managed IT provider, but that covers some of the other, these other components um, so that's, that's one, just build it into uh, grant budgets as well as our own organizational budget. Um, and you've, you know, just hold, it's one of those things I think that we just have to hold the line on and say these are important infrastructure costs that we can't compromise on. We can't, we can't responsibly provide these services unless we're backing them up in this way. And, you know, as somebody who I became the chief information officer at Legal Services about four years ago, and we started talking about security and cybersecurity when that happened and we shifted to a managed IT provider. And there was just a lot less um, motivation from management to pay for these sorts of things. It was like, well, we're fine. Who wants to hack a legal aid anyway? Like those were the <laughs> sort of the, the things I would hear. Um, and that's definitely shifted. But what's really helped is you know, things like this training, being able to point to a train like this to an executive director and say, you know, we are, we, these are real concerns. These are top 10 tips. These are things we should be doing. LSC has updated a lot of what they're asking for. So even if you're not an LSC program, you can hold up some of the things that they're even asking in their annual application. The cybersecurity insurance, applying for that has helped really highlight that these are costs, but this is just the cost of doing business now because our managed IT provider services, when we added the cybersecurity component that they provide, pretty much doubled overnight. Mm -hmm. um, but you just sort of can't work in 21 without a cybersecurity component to your, to your IT department. Um, and, you know, I think it looks different if you have staff um, in-house versus uh, managed IT, but either one, you sort of have to have that cybersecurity component into the, the plans and, and all these best practices that we've talked about. And I think we've gotten a couple of questions. Oh, this is a good one. I think you, you might have some information on this, Stacey, which is our office is paying for full cell phone bills for employees. Um, we're not paying the full cell phone bill, but we have a, a, a reimbursement for 
let me think whether it's, uh, uh, we reimburse uh, $30 a month for internet and $20 a month for cell phone services, just with a checkbox at the, you know, they have to, for tax reasons and whatnot, we make it through a reimbursement request. Um, so they do have to do that reimbursement. It's literally a form where they have to check those two boxes and send it in, and then they get that $50 a month towards that. Um, California is pretty strict about reimbursing for employee expenses. Um, so we didn't, I don't think we really had much of a choice about doing it at all, but the way we people have done, I know, have implemented that in many different ways. For us, it was we because I think we were sort of every three months thinking like soon we'll go back to the office. Soon we'll, we didn't do it monthly, but at the end of the year, we gave everybody a stipend for internet costs because we recognize that people, a lot of people, had to increase their internet, so that was part of the the sort of implementation um, concerns. Um, and I think just. To, to sort of wrap up our piece, because I know we're getting more questions, so I want to give time for that. But um, I think for for me, it was you have to get buy-in from the top and you have to communicate to sort of the staff. And those were the two sort of crucial things. Once you're, once EDs are on board and you can sort of budget appropriately for this, we were able to, to make a lot of these changes and plan for them. Um, and we had to bring staff along because we, you know, we wanted to do an MFA project and get everybody through multi-factor authentication. And it took like two months because some people were like, well, do I really need that? It was not a choice. It's not optional. So making sure that people understand that this is the way that the world uh, operates. And honestly, once you've had a couple of phishing scams be successful, that sort of gets people to start thinking about it a little bit more seriously. Um, John, I know you've been probably monitoring the questions. Yeah, um, well, and I, and I think some of it is, is uh... Um, is you know sort of supportive of what we've been what we've been talking about that that the um, you know the cell phone you know for instance for work purposes only as opposed to um, you know using it both personal and work and then you have some of the tax implications and I, and that that is an extra complication we don't want to make our staff's lives any more difficult than they already are um, uh, yeah so I, I I think one actually one question I have. Um, so, you know, there, there are challenges working with funders, but also what about um, uh, boards and other stakeholders? I mean, what do you, you know, are they prepared or how do you prepare them? Um, you know, if you're changing your budget or changing your approach, um, do, can they help? Um, what's, what, are, what are you seeing? Our board has been supportive of these changes. I think it helps that some firms have had some of these same security risks and security concerns, and they're seeing it as a best practice now too. So maybe three years ago, they would have said, well, why did the IT, IT manage IT services double? Um, but I think after they've probably had the same experiences in their firms, they've been supportive of our technology initiatives and, and making sure that we are secure, even though, you know, there could be the pitfall of like, but it's a legal aid program, but we have a lot of sensitive client data and we need to protect that information. Mm -hmm. Stacy, what about, what about you and your program? Yes, our board's been supportive of these efforts as well. Like I, the same thing, they've, they've all seen phishing attempts and ransomware, uh, at least in the industry, if not in their particular firm um, or corporation. So I, I think it's it doesn't seem out of line to them. Yeah. Um, and you know, and and some of the clients we work with in the legal aid community um, have gotten pro bono help from their board on some of the policies. So I, mm. I certainly would encourage folks. Um, if you have a good board or, or just know people who are volunteering um, with your local bar, your state or city um, or county bar who work for a larger firm or work for a firm with some cybersecurity uh, practice um, uh, to get some help. Because it's um, a lot of this obviously is, is uh, technology, but um, there's a lot of policy questions. Um, there's some liability issues. You know, it's risk management and law firms um, who work with a lot of corporate clients are you know, typically pretty good with that. Um, and uh, one um, uh, a client I, I recently they recently shared with us um, uh, a draft of, of a policy that um, that they developed for them that they really tried to simplify it, prioritize it. You know, you could come up with a hundred different policies, um, uh, but you've got to start somewhere. And I think some of these um, firms who you know again do this for their their for profit clients. Um, maybe help, help, maybe helpful and willing to to do this on a pro bono basis um, uh, for you. And our managed IT provider too provides a lot of these policies because they've done it, you know, for themselves. Uh, our managed IT provider, it's interesting, is also a um, they they actually come from an auditing background, so they 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 started their IT piece because of all the security concerns and IT concerns in the banking industry. Um, and so they provide a lot of policies out of the box and, and sort of we can then tailor them to our needs. And that's been really helpful too. 
So uh, both John and Elenia just talked a lot about policies. So I want to pose the question of, um, and maybe there's not a definitive answer, but like how often should people, even if they're not editing or updating these policies, like how often should we be looking at, 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 at these kind of policies? I, I think with the rate of change and, and I, we started doing this about a year ago, two years ago now before the pandemic, we when, when we update our, our COOP, our continuity of operations plan, we sort of look at all these policies again because things change all the time and we reference a lot of them there. Um, so I think at least once a year, unless it's a, you know, something that really is stagnant, but I just think with technology and the rate that things are changing right now, looking at your policy manual annually is a good, you know, and if you're looking at it annually, it won't be like when we didn't look at it for a couple of years and then it's a ton of changes. It's just some updates here and there. And I, I would suggest that you also do enough training on the policies or the practices with staff regularly, because it is a lot. Um, and it's not the only thing that your advocates are worried about. And so if you can break it down, um, give them refreshers. And really, again, they're, even within the policies you ultimately have, they're, they're probably the you know, 80% or 90% of the risk is, is going to be focused to a much narrower set of specific requirements um, that, that, uh, that might also be role-based. So if it is somebody who's you know, working in an administrative capacity or, a, or working on the finances, they're going to need to focus on different elements of that policy likely than, than an attorney working with um, clients in the field. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the training and as, as, uh, as, as we said, sort of the over communicating applies to all your policies as well, because um, it's not something that's necessarily intuitive for everybody. Um, speaking of training and keeping our staff abreast of the different policies um, that we want them um, to abide by and different technologies. Can, um, can you all speak to training and what have you seen that works and your staff is most responsive to and what trainings have they maybe um, not been so responsive to or, um, you know, are you doing web uh, videos? Are you doing calls? Are you doing, is it email? Just um, if you could just say a little bit of like how, how you're, training your staff and keeping them in the loop of what you're doing and why you're doing it. I think that'd be helpful. Well, I think one of the things that's not that effective is that we have our staff go through, a, a, actually, there's a couple of different versions of an online training that everybody's required to do annually. Um, and it seems to just not stick. Uh, you know, there's, it's a, there's a one that the state, does, well, a couple of different state agencies that require our, us to have our staff go through those. And it just doesn't seem to penetrate. And I don't know whether it's the format or the actual quality of the training. They seem to be produced by perfectly good people and the content seems solid, but it just doesn't seem to settle into people's brains. So what I found, while it's pretty ad hoc, uh, what I found most effective so far is every time we get a phishing attempt, I talk about it at staff meeting. I say, hey, this is what happened. You know, the bookkeeper got this email and they said, hey, can you change this? Per you know, I'm writing from, I'm on vacation, so I'm using my personal email. Can you change my, the, the bank that my check is deposited to? Okay. Um, and, you know, often they got pretty far down the road with that before somebody caught it and recognized it. So we try, I just try to highlight examples like that. And whenever somebody says, sends me an email and says, this looks fishy to me, then I, I really appreciate it. I send it back to them and say, thank you for being careful. You're right. Please delete that. Um, so it seems, it seems to be, it's hard to engage around it because the content is not familiar or interesting to many of them. One thing I found really helpful is what I call micro trainings. Uh, Cause I agree with you, Stacy. those long, we, and we do an, an annual cybersecurity training. And that one, I have to say our managed IT company is pretty good because they'll show you like your your worth on this on the dark web, and so people are a little bit more engaged in that. Um, mm -hmm. But but you know, for the most part, they, it's once and it's done, and they forget about it until next year when you have to do that training again. But I will get emails or questions uh, from time to time, and sort of like to your point that you share the information. If somebody asks, like, how do I encrypt an email? I do a little video and I send it back to them, walking them through the steps of encrypting it, and then I put it up on our stream channel, which is like our internal little YouTube channel on on Microsoft. Um, so people, other people can, can see it there, or I can reference it and send it to other people. So it's like, it's a little bit of, but then you save it and you can share it. And so people sort of ask for it when they need it in a lot of cases. And you want to be able to provide that on demand and not just give them like, here's a 30 minute training on, on cybersecurity and email. That's not what they're asking. They just want to know how to encrypt the email that they're sending out. 
Um, you know, some, so there are a number of companies that, that um, offer cybersecurity training. Um, one of the big ones is No Before. And I think what they try to do is, you know, do small trainings, basically a campaign. It's like a political campaign every month. And then they do some sort of testing. And, um, and so I think pretty quickly staff get up to speed and you have the statistics to sort of show that they're not falling for for some of these well crafted, and they, again, that's sort of part of the of the work of the program is to design these phishing att uh, attempts to to stump people if you can. Um, uh, but but the thing is, they can be good today or good for the next couple of months, but the attacks change and and our, our guard gets dropped. And so I think that repetition, small snippets, repeated, tested. Um, and then, you know, also if, if someone, again, we can't be punitive, we, we can't be judgmental, we've got to be supportive, we've got to, you know, figure a way that we can be more effective as, as trainers. Um, uh, it's our job to reach people. Um, and, uh, but, but I think if we know who's having a hard time with this, then it gives us the ability to focus a little bit more instead of, you know, taking everyone's time. Um, we can help, you know, the, the five or 10% of, of your staff that really need um, a little bit more guidance and maybe a little bit more one-on-one -on -one assistance. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna jump to the chat. There's a couple of questions in there. So the first question, are any of you actively utilizing dark web monitoring services? And if so, what services are you using? We, uh, our managed IT company does, but I don't know the name of the program they use, but they, and people will get an email saying, it looks like your password is, you know, has been breached or has been compromised and make sure you change this password. Uh, sometimes it's the, the biggest one I've seen is that it's always like old, old programs that people are like, does that website even exist anymore? Um, but if they've been using the same password and that's why you want it to expire, it could be a, a compromise. We don't use anything fancy, but I do run things through have I been by the whole you know domain through have I been pwned periodically just to see what pops. Yeah. yeah and and, and we, we certainly don't see a lot of firms um, using it, but but uh, again, I think the, the point about making sure whatever your policies are that you stress the importance of keeping um, passwords, passphrases, and, and again, passphrases are a little bit easier for folks to remember and manage as long as they're not like I love the Yankees might be a little bit too obvious or something. Um, uh, but but uh, not using their their old passwords or you know for you know Facebook or Twitter or Instagram with uh, or even their bank right you know um, uh, with your your firm's um, accounts. And so I mean I think again it's um, you know, there are the ways that we can sort of enforce some of that. Uh, actually, it's hard to enforce whether they're using, but like password complexity and, and the frequency of changing. But even as, as we suggested, getting folks to sort of sign a statement, like here are some of the, the top 10 things that we really need you to do to help us maintain a secure environment. It's low tech, it's low cost. Is it 100% effective? No, but none of this is. Is it harder to administer? Maybe a little bit, right? And so um, but getting uh, getting clarity with your um, uh, with your team in terms of what what those security priorities are, and then communicating and getting some sort of acknowledgement from staff, um, because certainly everyone has had at least like probably ten passwords of theirs in the past compromised on some site over the last you know fifteen years, if not a hundred, you know, and so we're. We, we know that those those um, user IDs um, you know vary a bit, but the passwords get reused, and that's a that's a huge threat. And one of the reasons why we're seeing again in the chat, you know, the the value of the MFA because um, while you don't want that password compromised, having a second factor um, can can really help mitigate the the risk that your account actually is compromised uh, when they get your password. Thank you. Um, the next question, are there any recommendations for password manager service? We use Bitwarden internally um, for you know, organizational passwords and I encourage people to use whatever they're interested in, but I, I feel like there isn't a whole lot of interest except for the people that um, I make use the, the organizational one. Thank you. Uh, I would just also suggest that, again, for anybody who is responsible for your administrative accounts um, or administrator accounts, folks who have elevated privileges that you really also want to focus in on, on their use of, of a good you know, password management uh, tool. And some of them are open source. 
um, uh, or you can use like a commercial, you know, uh, cloud-based solution, but, but making sure that they're also not reusing uh, administrative passwords across devices or services, um, especially if you have a team of folks, and this is something where you really want to talk to your um, IT consultants or, or helpers or, or managed service providers as well, right? You know, to make sure that they're not using some common password um, across your devices or even across clients. Um, so that's um, as bad as it is to have an account compromised for a regular user, it's, it's, it's definitely worse if they have privileges to do um, um, to make more changes to your environment. And I've personally used LastPass for a long time and I, and I like it. Uh, it's a little pricey for the enterprise one. So we are moving our staff to NordPass. Um, and I found that one to be more cost-effective, but we haven't, we watched, we did the demo, we did the, we priced it out, but we haven't started using it yet. So I can't tell you how good or bad it is. Great, thank you so much for that. This is taking a step back here, but I, what one of the comments, I think Ken, Ken mentioned that, that uh, his firm is paying, I love this for a part of the electricity for staff until they're back in the office, which is, you know, in, in New York, electric, well, in California, a lot of places, electric's not cheap, but but that's a really kind of important part of this equation. We're running, you know, air conditioning or heating or all, the, all this equipment. So I really love um, that that, uh, that they thought about the electricity costs, not just the uh, connectivity. I agree. Um, the next question, uh, I think this one's gonna be for Alenia. How do you promote your stream channel? Do you have champion uh, champion programs that uh, staff can engage with before coming to you or your help desk? So the stream channel is posted on the staff-wide teams page. It's also posted on uh, department um, uh, SharePoint sites. So it becomes accessible for people. And it's something that, you know, every training we do anything, I, I share the stream link. Um, people forget about it. So I'm not going to pretend like that's it. Everybody goes to it, but it is fairly low uh, effort to then share a link with them if they're calling me in or emailing about a problem. Um, and I always remind them, like, if you ever have questions about this, you can search our stream channel. Um, so I try to just, it's sort of what Stacy said about training. It's like, it, you have to keep reinforcing it. Um, I don't have, you know, unfortunately we, for a long time, it was me as the chief information officer and the managed IT company. Um, I, we've recently hired someone, so I'm hoping to have more, uh, help and sort of before things have to get to, to me. Um, but we're not that big a program. We, we have, you know, 60 staff, so it's not like we're all in, all in one location. So no, for the most part, those, those questions still come to me. Okay, great. Um, another question for you. Oh, sorry, John. No, no, no. Please. Uh, another question, uh, was someone asked, what is the name of your managed IT company that you use? So we, we're going to be using NordPass, and I said I personally have used LastPass, um, and Stacy mentioned another. Yeah, that was the password. I think they're asking about your, um, the IT company. That oh, I'm did. sorry, the, the managed IT company. Yep. Um, Genesis Consulting Systems, um, and I can share their link in the, in the chat. Um, they have been excellent. We've had them now for, this is, I think, our fourth year with them. Um, and we do like every two to three years because we have a contract with them. You know, again, look at other companies pricing. They give us a nonprofit price, which makes a huge difference. Not all of the companies we reached out to did. Um, so I'll put their information in the, in the chat. And then uh, David uh, uh, pointed out that uh, again, the, the the frequent password changes sometimes leads to um, you know people recycling passwords or incremental changes, and in that passphrases. Um, you know, uh, generally are considered sort of a, um, a more secure way. It's, it's easier for folks to remember typically. Um, it just can also be a little hard to type in. I mean, I've, I've definitely uh, used passphrases um, that, that people can't believe how long I'm typing for. <laughs> I'm answering my, but, but it is, um, again, that's, that's the thinking now, if, you're, if you don't have MFA, especially um, that's something, you know, long complex, but a passphrase which is even longer. And, and again, it, it can't be a very simple, it should be a simple statement. It should be something a little bit odd that makes sense to you. Sometimes you throw in, um, uh, you know, words in a different language into your phrase. Again, um, that, that helps um, make it uh, more secure. And we don't require password changes any longer because of that changed guidance, um, unless there's been a compromise. Right. And, and just one more word on passwords. One thing that 
so there's two ways that staff keep password that, that have really scared me. One is someone actually bought a password keeper. That's a big notebook that they write all their passwords. And then on the front page, you write your contact information. So should it ever get lost, someone can return it to you. I don't. So, um, and the other one is people would keep a lot of passwords in a Google doc. And that also scares me. Um, it's an unsecure document in, um, in the cloud. So now they've got a list of your, the URLs and passcodes and usernames for, for your important stuff. So make sure staff isn't doing that and is aware that they need to be um, keep use, I mean, to, to David, uh, to, I'm sorry, to John's point, I just read David's name, to John's point, using phrases that they'll remember and not have to rely on a, a list of, of passwords that is not secure. Um, one other um, thing I, I'd like to add, I mean, again, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of focusing in on some of the top items. It is broader. Um, there are, um, you know, security frameworks out there that sort of help guide you along um, sort of the path of really analyzing every element aspect of your IT, including if, you know, for instance, you do um, integration work, you know, across your applications, you hire a consultant to build some software or you're, um, you have someone in-house who's regularly doing that kind of work and modifying maybe your accounting system. So there, there are um, systems out there that sort of look across the, you know, kind of the end user work as well as the sort of operational and development side of it. Um, one I'll, I'll paste into chat is from a, a nonprofit um, uh, that, uh, that recently came up with a new version, a slightly simplified version of their security controls um, uh, that, uh, that I think is accessible. You, you know, it's, it's, I, I can't say it's necessarily all lay speak, but it's not all, all geek speak either. Um, uh, so uh, if you're interested, again, I mean, I think, you know, there may be pieces of this that I'm certain do not apply to your organization, but you can look at, at some of the um, uh, uh, elements for, you know, for the ones that maybe you, you feel like are, you're most at risk for. Um, so why don't you share that out? And somebody mentioned single sign-on earlier, and then absolutely, that would be the way to go. Single sign-on, you know, covered by MFA for everything would be ideal. It's 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 not as easy as it sounds. Um, you know, we just started looking into that and looking at, can we bring everything under an Okta umbrella, which actually has a very good nonprofit discount through uh, TechSoup. You can get 50 free licenses, but actually implementing it with the kind of spread of applications that we have out there is not that simple. Um, there's also, of course, the Azure AD identity option. But again, it's a great it's great in theory, but when and it's great if something is already in their catalog of integrations. But if you're using something that's a little bit one off, um, you may find that either it doesn't integrate or that you have the wrong version of it. You know, we looked at our um, our e-signing program, which says it does integrate with these things, but not only if you have the enterprise level of the package, which costs four times what we're paying. So it's it, yeah. it's it's a great goal. Even, even Zoom, you can do single sign-on with the right level of licenses. And so, yeah, I, I think it's, but it, but it's one of the things, I think, it, you know, certainly as soon as you can do it, you want to add MFA to anything critical uh, or, or with, with critical data. But, but as you're looking at new systems, hey, we're changing our accounting system. You're looking at it for security as well. And how can I make this uh, simpler and therefore in some ways more secure? Um, uh, but Okta or Duo, generally speaking, are, 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 I think, really good at allowing you to integrate if the application or service you're trying to connect to supports it. Um, and, and again, you might push your provider um, to uh, enable SSO. Um, and, you know, uh, recently, they're, you know, one of the big case management systems providers both put out sort of a homebrewed version of MFA and also the ability to, to, uh, to use single sign-on. And, and that's critical. And so now we, you know, there's sort of no excuse um, for any provider not to at least use their, their, their freebie version of MFA, if not do the integrated. There's another question about uh, timeframe to release a locked account automatically without causing security risk. Um, uh, someone's you know, seen policies um, for hours, some for minutes, and uh, and recently we've seen from insurance companies um, uh, that it has to be done manually, that it can't be automatic after like just three attempts or something. So it's it, you know, which just becomes a real management um, headache or support headache, I guess, and and staff headache. Um, I don't know. Do uh, does anyone have any suggestions there on? 
how long the timeout should be. I, our managed IT company, has, I think I said it for like 20, 30 minutes. I can't remember exactly, but um, that's a good point. I don't know if there should be, I, I know that it would cause, especially with how frequently people forget their password. If we made it much longer than that, um, we'd start getting some some complaints from staff. And Mike, Michael says they use 20 minutes as well. Yeah. And I think again, the over communicating, there's no such thing. So letting folks know this is what's gonna happen. And hopefully don't don't call us at three in the morning with your um, account lockout. It will it will go back to uh, being accessible, but you just have to wait. Um, but that's where again, password, you know, all these things taken together. If you have a password manager that automatically populates your password or you have single sign on, you have fewer of these issues popping up. So we're you know looking at it from the user perspective, just like we're doing that when we're looking at you know designing tools for clients, um, you know that, that user experience, that user interface. Um, so we really should be thinking about that. Um, and then and then maybe again, deciding with staff and making some sort of uh, judgment call on where, where that number should be. John, this is, this is Michael from LAFLA. Uh, also too, with uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, you can go into the compliance uh, part of Azure and set up rules so that if, if you have it set, so like say it, it unlocks the account after 20 minutes. If they if they do it again, then you could send an email to your admins, uh, letting them know that there's an issue that somebody's trying to get into your system, and you can look at it further. So you can there there are those safety precautions that you could set up in the compliance center of Azure that will help out with some of those things. Love it. Thank you. Yep. And that's sort right. of, that's also sort of part of the logging or you know, like what, how do we get notified? And that's, um, uh, the dear just, do you want to, we just sort of posted a link in here for some, you know, 10 questions that uh, we were thinking executive directors or, or, or executives within programs should be asking their IT leadership or IT partners or both. And then, and then sort of 10 things that the IT leaders um, should be um, thinking about or, or pushing with their leadership. And, uh, Again, it could be 20 of each or maybe even more, um, uh, but we had, to, we had to sort of simplify it, cut, you know, cut, it, cut it back a bit to uh, make it a, a good starting point. Yes, I just wanted to share those as people start to um, drop off. I just did want to remind everyone that this will be recording will be on LSN tab along with the info sheets. So if you don't grab the link in the chat, they'll be available there. Um, and it looks like we have just two more questions. Um, is, someone's asking, um, our advocates go off site for an eviction clinic and we're concerned about access to secure Wi-Fi. Any suggestions for mobile hotspots? We have Verizon mobile hotspots and they've been We've been pretty successful with using those. We don't let staff use you generally use uh, Wi-Fi at like the courts or offsite intake or anything like that. So uh, they provide the devices for free, and then it's an uh, unlimited plan for I want to say like fifty dollars a month. Um, and actually, so the I think Michael mentioned the Cradle Point. So they're devices that are that are sort of geared to use four G and and now five uh, G in some cases um, uh, wireless internet access to do a really good job of making it accessible to multiple devices. Um, I just, I, I, I think we've, we've seen a lot of problems with multiple people using uh, mobile hotspots and the quality of the connection. Um, so I would just be um, uh, cautious. I would, I would test it out um, before you get uh, staff or even volunteers doing a clinic with inadequate internet that that can really de be you know, demoralizing. Um, uh, but but uh, one of the things that we've seen during the pandemic, and I just saw it again, was that you know T-Mobile, and this is where you might have to partner with a few other organizations because there's a minimum device count of like 100 devices, but they have a tremendous um, a deal for like $15 a month for phones with mobile hotspot, unlimited, um, everything, um, which is which is uh, kind of what it should be, um, but unfortunately isn't very often. So. Um, another uh, Verizon has a prepaid service. Um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, I'm I'm spacing it. Uh, that I, I will put in the chat. But but again, theirs is uh, 
um, a device that lets you use the phone fully, but use it as a hotspot. And if you have um, like four people, it's $25 a user. Um, so there are certainly, if you're going to be providing devices and, and paying for that internet service, it's worth, um, worth doing the, uh, the research. And then and someone mentioned the mobile, uh, oh, Stacy mentioned <laughs> the mobile beacon devices. And Jerry provided the link, thank you. All right, well, that looks like that's all of the questions that we have um, in the chat for now. I uh, just want to say thank you to both of our panelists today for coming and sharing um, with us and answering all of these questions. Again, this all of this information uh, will be available on Ellison Tap's website.